My name is Mark Lonica. I look after the individual investor team here in Australia for Morningstar. And today we're going to talk about lessons from great investors. I think we're going to have a shorter one today, unless there's a lot of questions. So if you have questions, obviously send them through. First, we have to do our housekeeping items. So anything you hear today is general advice. I don't know anything about you. I can't offer personal advice. And if you're over in New Zealand and you would like a copy of our FAP, go to our website, morningstar.com.au for that. And the New Zealand regulatory authorities would encourage you to go to a financial advisor if you need personal advice. All right, so let's get started. We're going to talk about lessons from great investors today. So I took a little bit of a different approach um, to try to keep this, I guess, interesting. Um, The other thing is we did put out the rest of our webinar series for uh, the rest of the year. So if anyone wants to sign up for that, you can just go to our website and you'll see on the right-hand side of the page um, on .com.au, you'll see a little sign up and on premium, if you go to our homepage, it's on the right top. So if you're interested in those, we'll send out an email some point. I'm interested in those, go sign up. All right, so let's get into this. Okay, so we're going to start out with Jim Rogers. So Jim Rogers, pretty famous investor. He worked at a hedge fund with George Soros. And he's also famous for these big trips he's taken around the world. So, And he wrote two books on them. So Investment Biker is one of them. Where he And I haven't read either of his books. I will say that, although I should. This one, he wrote his motorcycle around. And then later... He took his wife and built this custom yellow Mercedes and drove all over the place as well. So I can't really say much about the books because I haven't read them, but, uh, but yeah, something to put on your list. All right. So let's, uh, let's start with, and we're going to start with two different themes that I think are potentially relatable to where we are today. And we're talking about this theme, the more certain something is, the less likely it's going to be profitable. And then we've got, of course, a quote from uh, from Jim. So really the thought process behind this and why I wanted to bring this up, and we've, we've talked about this a couple of different times, but just this notion of um, sort of this first order thinking that I think a lot of people have gotten into and have gotten into based on the fact that we are except for a very short blip, um, we are in a very long-term bull market right now. So back to the GFC in all reality. Now, I know the market did fall 20% and more during that little COVID dip, but it was so short um, that you know I don't think it really did much at the end of the day. Um, so I think people have become very comfortable sort of this first order thinking, and that is that if you think something's going to happen, and these are my comments always about thematic ETFs. If you think the world's going to do something about climate change, um, and that's going to lead to more battery technology, then if you just buy batteries, you'll make a bunch of money. And you know, I, I think the notion that sort of Jim is talking about here is just the fact that you know the consensus view is rarely profitable, right? Because that is priced into shares, and I think that a lot of people have lost sight of that that very rosy scenarios are a priced in to a lot of shares that are out there, which means that the only way that you're actually going to make outsized returns on these is if things exceed the consensus. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of areas that are like that right now. So I think it's always good to take a step back and realize what this concept of something being priced into the market means. Means that anytime we're buying an investment, it is future expectations that are driving the price of that share, not what happened in the past. So you need to be aware of what those future expectations are that's already priced into that share that you're looking at. Um, So yeah, you know, I think... This quote sums it up pretty well as well um, that, you know, people seem to be drawing these sort of first order straight line between something that they think is going to happen and good investment outcome. And history would suggest that that's not actually true. So I pulled some other quotes out here from other famous investors that I thought were good around consensus driven investing. Um, so I won't read all of these because obviously everyone can hopefully read out there. Um, but you know, all of them sort of 
pertain to this notion that you should not follow the crowds, that it's rarely profitable just to follow the crowds over the long term. Now, I think the, the problem is that right now, people have it ingrained that it's very profitable to follow the crowds, but we'll see over the long term. Historically, that has not worked out. And I really like this quote down here, Ray Dalio, who is the guy that started Bridgewater, which is one of the biggest hedge funds in, uh, in the world. Um, so yeah, I thought, uh, I thought this sort of summed it up very, very well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the first lesson from Jim Rogers and a bunch of other investors as well. All right. So continuing to sense the theme, we'll move on to James O'Shaughnessy. Um, so anyone who listens to podcasts maybe knows his son. So after investing compass, the second best investing, uh, investing podcast out there, in my opinion is, and it's sort of veered away from investing actually, but his son, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, um, is, uh, has this podcast called invest like the best. And originally, if you go back and listen to some of the old school episodes, they are more investing oriented. He's gotten Patrick, his son has gotten very into kind of venture capital and startups. And, uh, and that's sort of the turn that it's taken. But if you go back and listen to the original ones, they're very, uh, they're very investing focused. There is one where he interviews the founder of Morningstar, um, so I thought that was a good episode, but once again, I'm probably biased. Um, but anyway, we're going to talk about arbitrage human nature. So what's arbitrage? Arbitrage is a risk-free profit. And, um, you know, this quote that he has on here is talking about a couple different things, but, you know, basically the, uh, this whole first part is this whole concept of this time is not different. Um, that whatever the fad is, um, it is, uh, whatever the fad is, it has happened before. And maybe the thing could be, you know, tech stocks at some point, it was tulips at some point, the South Sea bubble, like we can go back through history and the same thing has happened over and over and over again, where maybe the mechanism or, or the, actual, um, the actual instrument that this mania was centered around has changed, but the same thing happens again and again. And, you know, this, this sort of last part is this whole notion um, the quote that we always hear that in the short term, the market is a voting machine and the long term, it's a weighing machine. So, yeah, we need to understand that people determine supply and demand, at least in the short term, is what is going to move stock prices. But realize that all these emotions that people go through. So when we've done these on behavioral finance, we've talked about the influence that that that, that behavioral finance has had uh, or the influence that all of our ingrained behaviors have on uh, on share prices is uh, is pretty profound and can lead to bubbles and can lead to, of course, giant slumps in the market as well when people are fearful. So I like this quote by uh, by James O'Shaughnessy. So he is an investor. He started a firm that got sold to Bear Stearns. Then he, I don't know what that means. Um, Got sold to Bear Stearns, then he bought it back. So it's called a Shaughnessy Asset Management. So it's actually a um, a kind of factor driven quantitative investment shop. So basically, they're looking at a bunch of different factors, and then uh, and then computers are investing based on stocks that meet those criteria. But his son Patrick is now the CEO. But anyway, that's a Shaughnessy Asset Management. Um, Okay, that's a good question. I will get to that one in a second. So we had a question from Facebook. So thank you for that, Nigel. I will get to that in one minute. All right, let's keep moving. So I found a couple other quotes about how human nature impacts investing. And once again, these are all quotes around rationality and that people often are not rational um, and that that is going to drive um, deviations between price and value. So what we always talk about, what we talk about at Morningstar is we believe there can be differences and in some cases, large differences between the value of a company and the price that people are willing to pay for it. So when we get greedy on the upside, of course, the price exceeds the value. 
Consequently, when things turn south and people are very fearful that whatever is going to happen, every company is going to go out of business, then of course we have prices that can be well below the value. And that's what our job is. And once again, to go back as a contrarian, that's what our job is as investors to find those opportunities. Um, so yeah, we've got all the sort of classics here. So Phil Fisher, he wrote Common Stocks, Uncommon Profits. So sort of the you know, I don't know, an early proponent of growth investing. Um, Sir John Templeton, this time is different. One of the most famous quotes in investing. Um, and you have a famous Ben Graham quote that the enemy is likely your own emotions. All right. So there we go. All right. I always talk about, so people have done this one before. I like talking about Hetty Green, and this is along the same lines as some of the other things we're talking about as I shuffle through my unorganized papers. All right, so Hetty Green, let's talk about who she is. So Hetty Green was alive in the late 19th century, and she was one of the most powerful financiers in the world. And she obviously was a woman, very rare back then, but she made a $100 million fortune. So $100 million fortune back then would be worth $2.3 billion today. And she was called the Witch of Wall Street because she dressed all in black and was very cheap, um, which probably was a little bit of an exaggeration. But there are all sorts of stories where she wouldn't pay for her son's surgery and things like that. But anyway, what she did is, and obviously the economic cycle was a lot more volatile back then, but what she did is she invested. She was a contrarian investor. So when there were panics, she had a bunch of cash. She, of course, would use that cash to lend to people. She would use it. Um, she would make those loans. And the collateral was generally real estate. She liked real estate. And then, of course, when they couldn't pay her back, she'd just take their real estate. Um, so that is one of the ways she built this very large fortune. Um, so, yeah, I don't have it in front of me, but she amassed this enormous real estate agent basically by lending people money during panics, um, which sort of continually happened back then. Um, so you can read her quotes up there. But this is this whole notion of investing that people will say, right, that the whole way that you make money off of investing is to buy low and sell high. And then most people go and do the exact opposite. So just a demonstration, once again, of how contrarian investing can be very successful over the long run, which means that a lot of people will think that you're crazy. So they could think you're crazy now, but you aren't doing what everyone else is doing, which is throwing your money into thematic ETFs and Bitcoin and everything else. But over the long run, following the herd has not worked out very well. All right, we're in talk, and this is, once again, continuing the same theme. So Brent B. Shore. So Brent B. Shore, um, he's actually been on, the way I got introduced to him, he's been on this Invest Like the Best podcast uh, with Patrick O'Shaughnessy. So it's all coming together. Um, but he, uh, he basically runs kind of like a private equity firm for small businesses. So what he does is he goes out and he buys small businesses, you know, maybe like a million dollars in revenue um, and uh, has done very well doing that. And one of his, and so he's obviously spends a lot of time, basically all of his time analyzing businesses, so not analyzing like we do as investors in public markets, not analyzing you know, balance sheets and cash flow statements in annual reports, but actually spending time with the founders of these very small companies and goes in there and just buys them. So he's basically building this portfolio of small companies. But same things apply if we're talking about public markets. So what, uh, what does he say here? Well, at the end of the day, things do not have to be exciting in order to be good investments. And one of the problems that I think we run into is we typically go out there and want to talk or people want to talk about their investing. They want to investing. They want to talk about the exciting world changing companies that they're investing in. But over the long term, sometimes boring businesses are pretty good. Um, and it's something that uh, it's something that I personally believe in. Um, a lot of the stuff I own is pretty boring. Um, and, you know, these are sort of these just 
you know, non-cyclical companies that continue to sort of churn out profits and get very good at um, get very good at just selling, I don't know what, selling soda if you're Coca-Cola, right? Like just get very good at these sort of boring approaches to, uh, to investing. So um, yeah, something to remember, doesn't have to be the latest fad, doesn't have to be some great new technology. I mean, those are certainly the ones that will be huge winners, some of them, but most of them will probably be pretty big losers. And you have to think about, are you the person that can go out there and assess what impact technology, this new technology or some new biotech drug is going to have on the world? And can you make an accurate assessment of the, uh, of the value there? All right. So I think we're on our last one now. Then we've got a couple of questions. But as I said, this one will be short. So same, same thing that we're talking about here. Um, so we are talking about simple, well-understood businesses. So a lot of this is around um, the same concept that uh, Warren Buffett always talks about when he talks about his circle of competence. Um, and so same message around looking at some of the new technology and whatever new cryptocurrency that comes out, make sure that you really understand what you're investing in. Um, so same message. I mean, same message as we had, uh, as we had previously. Um, but sort of keeping things within that circle of competence is really important. Really understanding that business is important. And it's important to understand a business for all sorts of reasons. Number one, because you want to be able to assess when it goes up a lot, when it goes down a lot in the future, you want to be able to assess whether those moves are actually justified. And that means really understanding the business, understanding the factors that are going to influence the business. Um, so that is, uh, that's really important as an investor. All right. I think we've done it. Uh, got through the questions. So if anyone has any other questions, you can email me at mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com. I'll call HR back, see if I got fired. And, uh, and if not, I'll be back on Tuesday. So we'll send an email with, uh, with the new um, webinar series that's out there. And also you can just visit our website and sign up for anything. All right. Thanks, guys. Any advice in this video is general advice prepared by Morningstar without reference to your financial objectives, situation, or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest.